Let me welcome you all. Um, I'm Ashutosh Varshne, um, Director of the Center for Contemporary South Asia and Professor of Political Science. Um, and this is our third Watson event on Afghanistan this semester. Uh, more uh, might happen, I think will, perhaps next semester now. Um, but it's, it's, it's our first event on Afghanistan and third event at the Watson Institute. And we are a center. The Center for Contemporary South Asia is a center of the Watson Institute. Uh, I approach this event with a mixture of uh, gratitude and expectation. And let me explain. I'm very grateful to our speakers for readily agreeing to come in person. They could have said, we will join you by YouTube. And that just makes both the intellectual interaction and the technical uh, issues so much more complex. So I'll be very grateful that uh, even at this difficult time in our professional lives, um, all four of you um, so readily agreed to to be here in person. I, I set up this uh, panel within, I, if I recall correctly, within 72 hours or, or four days of the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. <laughs> the expectation is also great um, because the expertise and understanding assembled here is truly formidable. Um, virtually peerless. One shouldn't say absolutely peerless because you know that requires a, a kind of judgment that at least I am unable to form. I, I think this is truly formidable and quite quite remarkable panel. Uh, I can think of maybe two other people if I had added to this that would have been really peerless. You know, they they. There was, this is the best expertise available in the United States on Afghanistan. So we will learn a very great deal today. <clears throat> I'm of course not a producer of research on Afghanistan, but I'm a huge consumer of um, the literature that appears, much of it written by, I've read virtually everything our, uh, on Afghanistan that our colleagues here have written. <clears throat> Um, but it's clear even to a non-expert that the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan is potentially transformative of world politics. Uh, and potentially, uh, I think, is being used advisedly because uh, whether or not it's transformative, time will tell. And it's not simply a South Asian politics event. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of great, grave magnitude in in world politics. And here are some of the questions that stand out. Perhaps our speakers will address some of these, but you know they are their expertise might um, might identify some other issues which are of greater significance. So, so we'll see. Question number one, or issue number one, question number one. A common interpretation is that um, post August 15, Afghanistan is not simply a case of Taliban, a Taliban victory, but also an example, also a great Pakistani victory and a decisive American defeat, perhaps the greatest since Vietnam, and a very clear defeat for India. Though not a military defeat for India, but a clear, clearly a clear political and strategic defeat. Does this common judgment have an acute short run bias built into it? Or does it hold up? for the medium and longer term as well, what do our experts think? Two, the Taliban are in fact 
at least two organizations. You could talk about some more, but two organizations for sure. The Afghan Taliban and the Pakistan Taliban. The Afghan Taliban have undoubtedly received patronage, very enthusiastic patronage, I think, of Pakistan's military establishment. But the Pakistani Taliban have been an arch enemy of precisely that establishment and have been hit very hard in recent years. How will this contradiction get resolved? How will this contradiction get resolved? What do, what do our four experts think? Three, should the Chinese, a new superpower undoubtedly, feel secure about Afghanistan? The, uh, the Chinese have severely repressed their Muslim minority. Um, would the Taliban victory in Afghanistan help the Chinese or hurt them, given their own relationship with their Muslim minority, the Uyghurs? For the implications for Kashmir. Uh, the, India has its, has, some of the Kashmir problems are clearly of India's making, of Delhi's making, no doubt about that. I've written about it, most of us have written about it. But um, some are symbiotically tied up with Pakistan and to some extent Afghanistan. What does the new Taliban, the second Taliban victory in Afghanistan hold for Kashmir? These are just some of the questions that I wrote up this morning. I'm sure uh, uh, our speakers will have uh, more issues um, and that they'll deal with. Um, the ground rules are that every all each speaker will speak for 15 minutes. Uh, and the order is uh, Chris, Christopher Clary first, Christine Fair next. Bipali Mukhopadhyay third and Hussein Hakani fourth. I'll introduce each of them as they come to the podium. Um, and then we'll open up for a Q and A, including, including questions and comments that come on YouTube. Christopher Clary is an assistant professor of political science at SUNY Albany <clears throat> with a PhD from MIT, my, my uh, parent institution as well. <clears throat> His research focuses on the sources of cooperation in interstate rivalries, the causes and consequences of nuclear proliferation, US defense policy and politics of South Asia. And my series at, the, at Oxford University Press New York, Modern South Asia series, is going to be the proud publisher of his first book entitled The Difficult Politics of Peace, Rivalry in Modern South Asia. Uh, I think uh, sometime next year, the book will be out and will attract a great deal of scholarly and policy attention in the United States, in Pakistan, in India, and I think Afghanistan now. So Chris Clary first. Welcome. Thank you, Ashu. I'll, I'll stay seated if that's okay. Um, and let me, let me start by making kind of what I would frame as two meta points. Um, at the outset that I think uh, will encompass the more substantive and analytic points I'll make to follow. First, you know, I'm not an Afghanistan expert. I'm an India and Pakistan expert that worked on Afghanistan periodically in the U.S. government and in consulting for the U.S. government afterwards, especially when it involved India and Pakistan equities, which it did at many points. Uh, but I'm focused on, on the, you know, south of the Durand Line but I'll stretch today uh, and I think have some useful things to say. Uh, the, the second point is I'll try to draw out some contrast where I think my ideas may differ from the fellow panelists. You know, we, I probably share 90 or 95 percent of the worldview of the people sitting next to me. I have all of their books uh, on my bookshelves at home. They're at home because I don't go to the office very much and I have to reach for them somewhere. I don't know if I have every one of Ambassador Haqqani's books. He's very prolific, so it's hard to keep, uh, keep up with him uh, in that regard. 
but I've learned an enormous amount from them. But I'm e even with that said, I'm going to focus on the five to ten percent where we might disagree. And, and one way, I think the principal way we might disagree is I I am likely the most sympathetic to the to U.S. policy of anyone at the table. Uh, I believe U.S. policy options in South Asia and Afghanistan for the last 20 years have been quite poor. And while we did not accord ourselves with any great strategic genius, uh, we played um, that poor hand uh, and, we, and we lost. And in the process, uh, I think it's also fair to say that the vast majority of the people of Afghanistan lost as well. Um, so, you know, I want to sort of talk a little bit about that loss, but also what we do next. So with those meta points out of the way, let me let me make, try to pivot to six substantive points I want to make. The first point, point one, is that the U.S. government was aware of Pakistan's actions in Afghanistan and talked about them for at least a decade and knew about them privately even before. And so what this gets at is um, has commonly been the reflective question about you know since the events of August. How did, how did we lose? Like, why was the Afghan war lost? And my answer is not particularly original, but I think it happens to be correct, which is we lost because of the pathologies of the Afghan state and uh, the presence of safe haven and support for the Taliban uh, and the Haqqani network in neighboring Pakistan. Essentially no counterinsurgency since World War II has been successful when there's been a contiguous safe haven next door and the events of the last year do not change this pattern. Uh, this was not, though, I would argue, a policy failure that emerged from total ignorance. Uh, for the last decade, some variant of the following language appeared in numerous U.S. government public reports. Pakistan, quote, remained a safe harbor for regionally focused terrorist group groups. It allowed groups targeting Afghanistan, including the Afghan Taliban and the affiliated Haqqani network, as well as groups targeting India, dot, 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 to operate from its territory. That's the 2019 State Department uh, terrorism report. In 2013, the language is not radically different. Other groups, quote, such as Lashkar Taiba, were able to continue, lead to, op uh, to continue to operate in Pakistan. Pakistan did not directly target the Afghan Taliban or the Haqqani network. So really after 2011, after Admiral Mullen testified in, in front of Congress, kind of lambasting the Pakistani state for uh, its support of the Haqqani network in particular, uh, the public declaratory policy was, was clear. And I think privately long before there was a sense of the safe haven in, in Pakistan, the safe haven that was abetted by the Pakistani state. Um, and in some cases more than just uh, a willful blindness, uh, that was the principal challenge with the insurgency along with the weaknesses of the Afghan state. Point two, despite that continuity, that sort of analytic continuity about the problem of safe haven, there was an important policy shift that happened in 2011 which is prior to 2011, there was a belief in DC that yes, Pakistan was the problem, that there was the safe haven, but what we needed to do was hug Pakistan very, very tightly and tell it like Robin Williams' character in Good Will Hunting, it's not your fault, right? And, and to give it money, to give it military assistance, to give it military aid, to give it hardware, so that Pakistan's security concerns could be addressed and then the pathologies that emerged from those security concerns could be attenuated. But after 2011, Salala, Raymond Davis, Aftabad raid, after that, DC shifted largely to say that's not possible. Um, and it's crazy in a way because the US Congress passed this giant bill, we're gonna give Pakistan all this money, Carrie Luger Berman, and it kind of exactly like the climax to a film. It was like every, that, that the money came just as the policy landscape was shifting. So the money kept on, as money does in the DC landscape. The money kept on going for years after, um, I think the analytics switch occurred. And we shifted the relationship to a more transactional relationship where it was this halo of coercion uh, that was there omnipresent in the US-Pakistan relationship. I'm not saying there weren't lower level people in the US executive that sort of thought maybe we could love Pakistan and the changing after 2011. But I do think at the medium to higher levels, there, the illusions had substantially diminished. Point three, even once the US policy became more coercive, uh, there was a sense that, that you could only do so, we can only do a little coercion, right? That, that too much use of coercion would be injurious on net to US interest. So the logic in DC was mostly because of the map, right? So Afghanistan is surrounded by a ring of unsafe reactors. 
And as a consequence of that map, the US could not identify a path that leaned on those regional actors other than Pakistan in order to support its vision in Afghanistan. So the US had rejected a potentially positive Iranian role very early in 2001 and 2002, right? Because of hubris by the Bush administration, as well as priors about uh, the sort of state Iran was in the international system. Uh, we considered periodically when I was in government having a more prominent role for India, uh, but we concluded, and I think accurately, that the only states in the international system that could make a strategic difference in Afghanistan, besides Afghanistan itself, were the United States and Pakistan. The United States had a chance to do favorable or unfavorable, and Pakistan mostly had that spoiler role, which it ultimately played. So the US struggled in the Bush and the Obama years, uh, in part also because we had worsening relationships with the Central Asian Republic, right? You can come to Afghanistan through Iran, which is what India advocated for, told the US that they said, make a deal with Iran. We have to make a switch, You're, you chose the wrong side. And the US said, no, we have all these other interests. The Iranians are trying to assassinate people, all these things. And we said, we can't do it. Or you can go through the Central Asian Republic. But in 2005, we said, you know, we told the Uzbek government, stop killing your people. And they said, we don't like that, get out of uh, our, air plate, our air base at uh, Karshi Khanabad at K2, as it was lovingly known, uh, which we, the US did by the end of 2005. We had a second facility at Manas in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and that facility at Manas was in continual pressure since 2009 onwards, right? The Kyrgyz eventually, they, initially they said, give us more money. We said, okay, here's, here's hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, there was a, a Kyrgyz revolution in 2010. It was actually small arm fire uh, on, the, on the periphery of the airport, right? So the, the Manas facility, which was this other route into Afghanistan, was under danger. And then, and then after that revolution, when President Adambayev comes in power in 2011, he says, I'm going to tell the Americans they have to leave by 2014, which is when we do, right? So the, the principal routes into Afghanistan were, were through Pakistani airspace uh, and occasionally from Pakistani bases, so it is reported, um, as well as through Central Asia. So I think in, in some extent, the collapse of the government and the inability of regional actors to do anything about it. Once the US decided to get out, the regional actors were either supportive of the Taliban takeover in a, like a modest way, or, or like India decided to basically sit aside for the last several months. And I think that does kind of reinforce the conclusion we had made in the government that the regional actors were not gonna be able to make a difference. Point four, the map was not the only reason the US was hesitant. There was a concern that too much pressure would turn Pakistan into North Korea. There was concern that Abdul Qadir Khan, who had just died, was a symptom of the pressure environment in the 1990s. And he would, and, and things like Abdul Qadir Khan would happen again if you put an, a more force of pressure on Pakistan. There was obviously the relationship with drone strikes. Some of them were helpful to the Pakistani state, I think should be mentioned explicitly. And then, sure. And then uh, there, uh, was a stream of intelligence from the ISI and others to the U.S. about terrorist plots against the West, right? So that you can tell the CIA and Langley to eat an enormous amount of poop uh, if they think they're getting intelligence that is disrupting plots, right? They're willing to accept that. And so it was not necessarily the policy arms of the state that were so worried about this, there were also these other channels, some of them only partially visible, point five. So we lost the war, Taliban taken over, a civil war might start soon, right? Uh, Connie Network, Islamic State, Taliban, other factors. The map continues to dictate this same unpleasant logic. According to press reports, the US maintains an over, -horizon, over the horizon strike package based out of the Gulf. That is consistent with the published ranges of US drones, so it seems entirely plausible to me. Uh, but if one wants to maintain overwatch or even the ability to strike uh, Afghanistan on, a, on an ad hoc basis, that requires Pakistani airspace to get to Afghanistan. Uh, one could make a deal with the Central Asian Republic that probably would require making a deal with Russia in the process. Uh, you could base out of the Caucasus as well, but you'd still need to transit over some Central Asian Republic state. And that still means that the basic leverage that Pakistan had is there, albeit substantially attenuated given the diminished logistical flows into Afghanistan. That doesn't mean the US government doesn't have options. 
Uh, in particular, the U.S. gave Pakistan a series of perquisites in the 2000s, uh, one of them you know, being major non-NATO ally status. Uh, you know, these, these things can be removed. And uh, my, my sense, I could be wrong, is that the U.S. government is hesitant to remove them until it sort of needs to remove them, right? It wants to keep levers available to it in, the, in case of future Pakistani bad behavior, right? We already had Pakistani bad behavior in the past, right? That sort of led to the, the loss of the war. Um, but there are, there are other things that can happen. You know, I, I'm, I think it's the civil military environment in Islamabad uh, is as unsettled today as it has been in many years. Uh, it is just the case that the way the sanctions regime is structured, it is very hard to put the maximum amount of pressure on the Afghan Taliban without also pressuring and restricting the ability of U.S. and other international aid organizations to provide humanitarian assistance. Right? This is a, this, the structure of the situation is not dramatically different than that that which faced the U.S. in Yemen uh, for the last several years. And the Afghan Taliban, the new regime, is going to, as other re unsavory regimes have done, hold their people hostage, right, in exchange for a, a, a weakening of the economic sanctions structure that was built to keep them in the box. So, uh, throughout this winter, we're going to we're going to continue to see worsening situations in Afghanistan cities, especially, and um, there will be choices that have to be made. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about recognition of the regime, uh, but there will be choices about how much pressure to keep on the regime, it, understanding that the suffering that happens is 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 not uh, entirely the regime suffering. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Christine Fair is our next speaker, professor in the Peace and Security Studies program within Georgetown's Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. Um, a very prominent uh, speaker on in the public sphere as well, uh, beyond her scholarship. She served as a senior political scientist with the RAND Corporation, a political officer with the United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan in Kabul, a senior research associate at U.S. Institute Peace's Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention. She took her PhD from the University of Chicago, uh, knows several languages of South Asia, uh, can converse in them, can almost lecture in them sometimes. Um, and among the many, several books that she has written, uh, some that have influenced my understanding of Pakistan, including Fight to the Last, Fight to the Last, Fighting till the end, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry yeah. Fighting till the end uh, hugely, hugely uh, shaped my understanding of Pakistan's uh, strategic and uh, military uh, objectives and ideologically, and they are how ideology uh, influences state behavior. Uh, and the most recent book, uh, which uh, on which she gave a talk in Delhi at my seminar uh, two years, three years ago. Uh, it's called, in their own words, understanding the lashkar e -Taiba. She knows this territory very, very well. Uh, welcome. Yes. So the problem with getting old and having bifocals is that you lose this really important visual range, and I am currently suffering from that. So, it, it, is it on? I'm going to submit it. So I don't disagree with Chris, as Chris anticipated. There's not a, a lot of light between us, but I'm going to start in a different place. As we are capable of waging war, this war was never winnable. And for those of you who have known me for most of the last 20 years. You will know that this is not new. This is a position I have inhabited for a long time. 
And the reason is structural. It is the map. And it's also, um, and here I think Hussein Akani and I will have a lot of overlap because his work has certainly informed my understanding, is the strategic culture of the Pakistani state. So this idea of a uh, quest for strategic depth, this did not go back to Zia, this did not go back to Benazir's time. This was something that the Pakistani state inherited from the British. And I can talk at length and bore you into submission if uh, you have any doubts about this. Afghanistan made some very early, I think we can only call them stupid decisions about what its life was going to be like next to its neighbor. Um, Afghanistan used partition to say that Pakistan was an illegal successor state. It was illegally seceding from the Raj. And once it came to that determination, it decided that any agreement that previous Afghan rulers had with the Raj were no longer valid. Most importantly, this was the Durand line. Pakistan was also deeply concerned about the notion of Pashtun or Pakhtun, depending upon which side of the Durand line you are on. Pakhtun is not a thing, something that the British cooked up. Because if you look at the 1936-37 elections and the 1946-47 elections, Pashtuns didn't want to be a part of Pakistan at all. So the Pakistani uh, state very early came to fear what Afghanistan was capable of doing, taking advantage of these very early ethnic fissures that were very clearly apparent in the state. If that wasn't called an epically bad idea, and there are other things they did like oppose Pakistan's admissions to the United Nations, which they quickly reversed. But if you look at Pakistani materials on this, the Pakistanis say what kind of upstart Afghanistan could do this without the backing of a more important state. So. If you look at Pakistani primary materials, they are convinced that India put Afghanistan up to this. And then Afghanistan also did some really foolish things. Um, it invaded several tribal areas in uh, what was, you know, the erstwhile Fatah, as well as Balochistan. And after the 1971 war, in which Pakistan lost half of its population, about 15% of its territory, which is, I might add, the most productive agriculturally territory, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was not going to put up with any more Afghan shenanigans. So in 1973, when Muhammad Daud ousted King Zahir Shah, and what was happening in nearby Afghanistan was very aggressive, top-down, Soviet-influenced modernization, the Islamists rebelled. Now, by the way, if you understand the way Afghanistan works, <laughs> the vast majority of the people that were rebelling against this were people who actually had a financial interest, right? So what do commies want to do? They want to do land reform. So when you go after land reform, you piss off the cons. The other people who benefit tremendously from land reform are religious people. So if you look at how madrasas are organized, they are money-making institutions. Don't buy the garbage you hear about, you know, the impoverished madrasa stuff. Um, if you go to any madrasa, you're going to see a whole host of economic activities. It's good old-fashioned uh, um, price subsidy. But the biggest people who lose money with land reform are shrine, basically these familial custodians of shrines. You go to anywhere in South Asia, I don't care whether it's a Hindu temple, a gudwara, a shrine, a church, there will always be approaches to that holy site with shopping opportunities because it is a part of the practice of worship to buy things. So who's making money off of this? The people who own the land. And if you know the history of South Asia, the custodial ownership of these religious properties was always in uh, hot contestation, right? So it's not very popular to say, I oppose the commies because they're going to take away my, my uh, very profitable land. What they instead said was, well, they're coming after our religion, right? Because that's a far more motivating, emotive argument than the economic interest being in jeopardy. So um, in Dari, there's a saying, you don't mess with my Zen, my women, my Zard, which is my property, my gold, or my Zameen, which is my land. And the communists did all of these things very aggressively. They went, went after patriarchal control of women's bodies by telling them what they could or could not wear. In this case, it was, you can't wear hijab. 
right? I think women would agree in this room, we're tired of men telling us what to wear, <laughs> just get out of our body's business. <laughs> but anyways, um, the Islamists who opposed uh, what Dowd was up to, um, he was not going to put up with a lot of shenanigans. And so he violently oppressed them. They went to Pakistan. Zulfa Ali Bhutto in 1973 sees this as an opportunity to do just, just desert to Afghanistan. In 1973, I want you, that's not me making a mistake, he sets up the ISI cell. And this is when Pakistan's jihad begins, right? Pakistan tells a story, oh, we were sucked into your jihad, my favorite. Uh, when I go to Pakistan, um, we were the condom that you used to screw Afghanistan. They would tell me this all the time because like, they thought they were going to like somehow embarrass me as a woman. And I would say, China also uses you as a condom to screw India. So maybe get out of the condom business. But nonetheless, they begin this in 1973. And going, I, this is where I want to pick up where Chris and I have a, a why I conclude that we never could have won this war. It's not until 2010. The, the Bush administration never understood what Pakistan was up to. The Bush administration never understood that when we handed the keys over to the Northern Alliance, that Pakistan's interests immediately were compromised. We never got it. We never understood the Northern Alliance was seen by Pakistan as a proxy for India. In fact, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the victim of the first suicide bombing in Afghanistan, did not die in Afghanistan. He died at an Indian field hospital in Fokar Aini. So from Musharraf's point of view, we handed the keys to the Indians. Second, I mean, there were three things that Musharraf thought we had promised him. Uh, that uh, we wouldn't hand the keys to the North Alliance, that Pakistan's strategic assets would remain viable and not in question, and then the whole Kashmir position. In quick order, you know, we got rid of all those things. Um, the Indo-US very bomb-friendly nuclear deal really made Pakistan rethink. And so if, you know, I play this game in my South Asia class, if we were to play, let's play Mashara, every single student in my class, when given the rules of the game, would make the same decision that Mashara did, which was very early to do a U-turn on his U-turn. Why could we not win this war? Well, it's the map. You cannot sustain a conflict without the ability to logistically source it, right? Logistics is like the Rodney Danger field of military planning. It gets no respect. And then you, you pay the price for that in the end. The other issue is that we were never waging a war in Afghanistan. And again, there's a short amount of time here. Talk, I'm happy to unpack it. There were wars fought over different time periods. From the US side, we were fighting two wars. The most important one was Operation Enduring Freedom. This begins on October 7th. And that is completely focused upon Al Qaeda. That is the only war that the CIA cared about. So when Pakistan handed over an Al-Qaeda number three, by the way, I would love to be the person who wrote that job on or vacant, Al-Qaeda number three, uh, qualifications are. So whenever Condoleezza Rice or whatever yuckety yuck would go to Pakistan, they'd pull an Al-Qaeda number three and, and CIA would say, Shabbat, this is our cooperation and it's working for us. But if you knew soldiers on the ground and this tends to be the community that I mostly interacted with and still do, they would tell a different story. Pakistan is perfidious. We, they're sending in their special services group uh, over there in Kunar. We know who we're fighting. We are fighting the Pakistan. CIA didn't want to hear it because at that point in the game, the Taliban were not our enemy, right? Taliban don't become our enemy until the Obama administration, right? So by the time we get to 2009, we have given Pakistan way too much leeway. And by the way, I, I have to, I, I adore you, Chris. Where the hell is that coercion? Simply saying to Pakistan, we're taking away our gifts. We're taking away our checkbook. We're not going to be nice to you in public anymore. That is not coercion. <laughs> coercion is what we did to Iran. <laughs> taking away our toys, that's not coercion, right? So even as we were understanding the problem set, the United States decides, oh, we're going to start a surge. What does a surge do? It makes us more dependent upon the very country that is, quite frankly, doing bad things to our backside while also benefiting handsomely. During the same time, money is fungible. Coalition support funds was a huge scam for the Pakistanis. They're using those monies to invest in their nuclear assets, right? By the time we get to 2009, it's the fastest growing nuclear program in the world, right? These are the assets that Pakistan then used to coerce us. Oh, you know, we're too dangerous to fail. Stop me before I shoot myself, right? This is why we find it so difficult to deal with the Pakistanis. But all of that complication aside, 
there were about 50 other wars being waged. If you were actually to look at our NATO partners, you would laugh. So on paper, at the height of the surge, there was like some innumerable number of countries, some innumerable number of troops, some equally innumerable number of caveats. My favorite experience was rolling out with the Germans in Mazari Sharif. Um, they got lost going to their own police training academy, right? And they thought they were keeping peace. They had all these t-shirts on their PRT mocking the, the, the fact that they were not really peacekeepers, but they said they were. Literally, the Taliban went whizzing right by. They had salutation. I mean, I'm sorry. I thought we were in a war. I thought these were the bad guys, right? Um, the Italians, they never left their PRT in Herat unless they were lost. Can't make this up about the Italians. I went to their PRT in Iraq as well as their PRT in Herat. You know, they deploy with a word, a wood burning pizza oven. So in the words of Air Force logisticians here in the US, is that palatizable? I can go through each of these PRT jokes. I, I, in fact, I call it the Epcot Center, the Epcot Center of Afghanistan. <laughs> so if you were a military planner planning an operation, the first thing you had to do was you couldn't look at those troops. You had, they actually had a program that you laid over that looked at the caveats, who are the real combat troops that we have in place? They used to talk about the ABCDs, the Americans, the Brits, the Canadians, the Dutch. Those are the only ones that would actually go out in combat operations. You cannot, and okay, so let's leave all of this aside. As Chris pointed, it's a significant, robust, and just unshakable fact that you can't be an insurgency when they have a state sanctuary. I don't even like to call the, the Taliban an insurgency because I think that does violence to reality. They are a fully owned property of the Pakistani state. By 2011, we know this, right? I, I, I mean, for crying out loud, Bruce Rydell, who is even more hawkish on Pakistan than I am, apparently until recently, uh, Obama had him write the assessment of the assessments. He's really clear about the role of Pakistan. This is where we also have an interagency problem. I have never seen an agency that hearts Pakistan as much as our State Department. So every time Congress would catch a clue and would try to enact something meaningful and coercive, the State Department would come in and they would say, oh no, we really need them. So the reason for this, these are just bureaucratic, bureaucratic equities. Like what's the job of the State Department? Now, the State Department is to engage, is to be diplomatic. Um, the job of USAID is to get money and to spend it, going to Chris's point, and I, I, I could go on, so I'm just going to make this point and I'm going to shut up. The pathologies of the Afghan state, ladies and gentlemen, are pathologies that we created. And I have a K2 amount of evidence to support this claim. Everyone was talking about the Balkan state building process. And people would say, oh, you know, on a per capita basis, Afghanistan is going to have like even a fraction of the resources. Well, you know what? It didn't and should not have had a fraction of the resources because Afghanistan didn't have the capacity to absorb it. And we did not have the capacity to execute it. So what did we do? We had large contractors take enormous contracts. As someone who used to be a COTAR at the U.S. Institute for Pakistan, which I believe you may know it by its other name, USIP. Um, it's the same amount of paperwork to write a $25,000 contract as it is a $1 million contract. So, and we had really lousy COTARs, no one wanted to go to Afghanistan. So we hired these institutional contractors. By the time you got through all of the contractor Kabuki theater, for, this was by a number of assess assessments, for every dollar we generously allocated, less than 10 cents stayed in, 10 cents. The corruption is absolutely enormous. We built this corruption, why? Because this becomes a slush fund that we can use to try to have leverage over Afghan, right? So the corruption, we also know from the counterinsurgency literature, fuels corruption. So by the time we get to Stanley McChrystal's self-serving interim report in which he advocates for the surge, no one pays attention to his other finding, which is we gotta do something about the corruption. Why won't we do anything about the corruption? A, we can't, and B, this is how we buy people. So in summary, listening to President Biden make a number of farcical comments about what happened to Afghanistan. For those of us, like Polly and I, we spent a lot of time on the ground. This has been a part of our life. It's easy for people who have never been there to be you know, the Aram Kursi analyst. They drive me nuts. She just shut up with your hot takes. I don't wanna hear them because people are dying. And it did not have to be this way. 
right? So I'm, though we fought this war in a way which I will argue we could not win, there was a different war that we could have won. We could have maintained a counterterrorism presence. That was always sustainable. Even at the very end, Biden could have said, Trump had a really bad set of ideas, we're gonna go forward. Why is this the case? We were not fighting. The ANA was doing all of the fighting. What were we doing? This also explains why the ANA fell. We were providing all of the air support, close air support, troops in contact, we're the ones that dropped coordinates. Maintaining all of their American systems that we insisted the Afghans use, why? To make us money. We were doing that through contractors. The Afghans didn't even have casualty evacuation capability. Right? Even I know when I would go to Afghanistan, bring some tampons, why? Get shot, they actually do that, they do a job pretty damn well, right? When we took all of that support away, what are the Afghans supposed to do? And we took that away very early. That was sustainable. But without fixing this Pakistan problem, they were still losing about 40 soldiers a day. That's not sustainable, right? This is the time when we no longer have a need for Pakistan to logistically resupply us to treat it like the enemy it is. Reem, why, why do we even have this ridiculous title of uh, non-NATO major ally? That's a farce, it was always a farce. It should have been removed 15 years ago when it was clear they were taking our money with one hand and killing our soldiers in Afghanistan with the other. Why are we not using Department of Treasury sanctions to go after people in the ISI, which we know that these people don't just support the Taliban, they also support the groups that harm us. This idea that, oh, these guys are only on this billet so we don't have to worry about them, is complete rubbish. So this whole policy of engaging the Pakistanis, um, I, I love the fact that their whole business model is um, we speak to per se, we raise snakes, and then we're going to sell our snake catching expertise to the world. This is absolute garbage. This state will not collapse. I'm going to make that point happy to send it in the Q&A. It will not collapse. We need to treat it like the enemy that it is, or we are going to be back in Afghanistan because it is the strategic culture of this country to use terrorist assets on the expanding nuclear umbrella to prosecute its foreign interests abroad. Christine has taken for years now. Um, and, and I've been right. My, my track record, yeah. I might be wrong about a whole lot of things. I never win the lottery, but on this. <laughs> but you have an argument. You have very, very clear positions uh, without um, adding unnecessary ambiguity to it. And some, some, for some unnecessary, right? But some people say, Ambiguity is necessary, so we, we'll figure this out as we as we, as we move further. Uh, Dipali Mukhopadhyay is our next speaker. She is an associate professor uh, in the global policy area at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs uh, at the University of Minnesota, um, and also a faculty affiliate at the Salzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. She was at Columbia. Uh, uh, School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia um, until her recent uh, migration to Minnesota. And uh, her, her, uh, the amount of time she has spent doing field research in Afghanistan and later in Iraq uh, uh, will come out, in Syria, will come out uh, shortly, as you'll see. Um, the book that uh, most of us found very enlightening was uh, was a uh, strongman governors and state building in Afghanistan. Um, uh, this was about war warlords. Cambridge published it in 2014. And the most recent book is Good Rebel Governance, Revolutionary Politics and Western Intervention in Syria, forthcoming with Cambridge University Press. So, Dipali. <laughs> thanks so much for having me and thanks all for coming. I. I think I'm going to pick up on um, the idea of the pathology of the, of the Afghan state, as, as Chris Clary put it in his opening remarks, and probably jump off where 
from where Chris Baird left off. I think for many observers, you know, it seems a real puzzle to look at the amount of resources and time and effort that were invested in a single country and then to see how rapidly its government collapses. How can that be? Um, and I think the puzzle can be unraveled quite easily once you confront the fact that the fragility of the government, the Afghan government, was predestined. It was a part of the DNA of the intervention from the very beginning. And I think for the reasons Chris Fair just explained, it's a very important time to underscore this argument because there's a kind of insidious narrative that has taken hold in Washington. If you were listening to any of the testimony of Secretaries Blinken or Austin on the Hill, and the narrative goes something like, you know, we gave the Afghan people and their leaders this incredible opportunity to govern themselves democratically and they didn't take us up on this, the generosity of our offer. So now it's time to rethink our own benevolent ambitions on behalf of others, but also to really be realistic about what these societies are capable of when it comes to governing themselves. So, you know, I find this to be quite an extraordinary story that we tell ourselves because in fact, we invaded Afghanistan to our own ends and did so in terms that in every way crippled any effort at building capable democratic institutions of government. And if you look at the parameters of the intervention from the beginning, they created these dependencies and conditionalities and restrictions that really doomed the project before it began by turning state building into a means towards a counter-terror end rather than an end in and of itself. And for me, the end of the war is a kind of coda that really punctuates and exemplifies this idea of what does it mean to say you're building a state in the service of countering terror. Um, I think really that what, what actually we were doing was creating a regime or attempting to create a regime that would be loyal to and dependent on us as outsiders. And in that sense, it was designed to, to remain weak rather than to overcome weakness and grow, grow sovereign. So, you know, I think a lot of scholars compare contemporary cases of state building and counterinsurgency to those from the Cold War and the post-Cold War. And there are obviously good reasons to make those comparisons, including the question of sanctuary over the border. But I do think the age of terror, as we can call it, is novel because of the perceived threat at hand. So intervening states are concerned with regimes and they're concerned with rebels but really of paramount concern are the terrorists, right? And so they represent the defining actor in the site of intervention. And so the outsiders who have this counter-terror agenda are articulating what are gonna be the parameters of war making and state making, even as they are thrusting the ultimate responsibility to manage the threat on those inside the country. And so you have these regimes that are birthed as a product of a meta campaign that I think paradoxically exists in the service of a mission that both needs a sovereign state and constricts the sovereignty of that state at the same time. So I think the Afghan case in that way was a kind of pilot for this latest version of clientelism and I think it's not a stretch to call it a neo-imperial project where we're configuring a form of rentier statehood in which we are asking a host regime to offer us the sustained provision of access to the territory. And we justify that the regime change, the reconstruction, the kinetic act, military activity, we justify that all with this perceived link between being ungoverned and having terrorists. And what the campaign, which was the first of actually several, um, underscored is, you know, state sovereignty has completely different meaning depending on which state you are. And for the Karzai regime and then the Ghani government, these governments owe their existence 
to this military campaign. And in exchange, they're commencing a new chapter in Afghan state formation, which has a very long history, some of which Chris talked about, even as they are unable to claim anything like monopolistic control over violence. And so basically they're getting the presence of foreign soldiers, donor agencies, international organizations, and sure that brings this huge amount of resources, which of course they can't actually absorb, um, but it also brings a whole series of binds, right? And that produced, and here I, I'm using this concept of precarity, which, which a friend of mine, Nura Lori, who's a political scientist at BU uses to think about what does it mean to be stuck in a limbo? She uses this in the context of citizenship, but I'm thinking about it in the context of sovereignty to be perennially and deliberately unable to control the fundaments of power and politics and to be simultaneously blamed for governing poorly and punished and manipulated right in the process. So, you know, we could just take three examples of decisions that were made early on that are crippling in that way. The first is the decision to collaborate with the Mujahideen commanders of the Northern Alliance because they have this historic animosity with the Taliban and they have the capacity to fight. And then, as Ashu said, I wrote my first book about some of them who became governors, but they, they acquired enormous influence in the security sector, disproportionate really with the size of the populations they represented, and then engaged in all sorts of predation and corruption of different sorts. So immediately the new government is contending with them, populated by them, et cetera. The second is to in exclude the decimated Taliban from politics. So most of us, when we think about a post-conflict state building project, there's a, some sort of peace process, some sort of a ceasefire agreement, some understanding between who the parties that have lost and the parties that have won. But in that moment of, vengeful rage after September 11th, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, everybody is all the same. The fact that the Taliban actually had leadership that sought to surrender to Hamid Karzai, there was no talking to the Taliban at that time. Of course, that story will completely change 20 years later. But So you have not that much unlike the debathification decision in Iraq, right? Uh, you're basically creating the basis for an insurgency by telling people who had power, you're not even going to be allowed to surrender and go home. And of course, where they're gonna go, they're gonna go over the border. And then third, the, the use of kinetic force, as we say, right? The, the deten arbitrary detention, destruction of property, taking people to black sites, taking people to Guantanamo, killing people in, in their homes, the daily humiliations of what it is to have foreign soldiers in your community, the possibility of being killed by a drone strike, all of that continually existing in an environment where you're asking a state to claim that it can protect its own population. Each of these decisions then disadvantages the palace in Kabul in meaningful ways. And at the same time, we're in the 21st century. So the expectation is governance should be good, which means we need elections, we need to have respect for human rights, we need to have respect for women's rights. This is leaving very little room for maneuver, right, for the new Afghan state. And it helps to, for me, explain the reliance of both administrations on forms of palace politics, which are really anchored in managing rivals. They're not, it's not, you're not incentivized to actually create effective, reliable, bureaucratized institutions. So regime preservation then becomes the focus above all else. And the work of the state then becomes becomes, you know, basically a product of the particularities and predilections of whoever is in the palace. And, you know, I made an argument, which I think several people disagreed with, but that the, under certain conditions that the Karzai government actually was able to transform 
otherwise threatening strongmen into valuable governors and use the highly centralized architecture of the state to play them off each other as competitors and pull some of that influence back into the architecture of the new government. These were appointments that overwhelmingly undermined many of the principles that we would associate with some Western conception of good government. But government did become the space under Karzai, I think, where strong men reimagine their political futures um, in new terms. Once I finished that book, by that time, there was a new president in power. And so I was interested in looking at, well, what how does a shift in who's in charge of the palace really affect the way center periphery relations play out? And, you know, I had argued for about Karzai that he had a kind of political choreography that read as corruption, but I think also we could describe it as what sociologist Joel Migdal called the politics of survival, right? And using the influence of appointments from the center to influence um, politics at the periphery. Now, when his successor came into office, Ashraf Ghani, there were some who expected a very different pattern of rule would emerge. He got a PhD at Columbia in anthropology. He was a senior official at the World Bank, wrote a book called Fixing Failed States. And so there was an expectation that he would construct some kind of independent and law-bound bureaucratic architecture and certainly rhetorically made it seem like, you know, the time of warlords, the time of donor influence, these are gonna be things of the past. But those of us who've been watching Afghan politics since he took office, we recognize very little of that vision in, in Kabul and in the provinces. And part of that again comes back to the interaction between his particular approach to politics and the parameters of the intervention itself. So he took the helm of what was called the National Unity Government, and it's not incidental that that deal was brokered by the Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State when there was a standoff in the election. And that so-called unity government came to represent such a narrow constituency that by the time I was in Kabul in June, just a few weeks before the government fell, people just called it the Republic of Three, which was a reference to Ashraf Ghani and his two closest advisors, Moheb and Fazli. Um, you know, I, for me, a lot of this can be explained by looking at the background of the president who was a member of the diaspora, who spent the formative decades of his career in the West. And I don't think had the ability to draw on the same broad social political networks and solidarities of his predecessor and really relied increasingly on this very narrow diaspora lead. So if you look at the policies and the appointments and the war plans of the last several years, you see this very regionalized, it's not even just ethnic, it was Eastern Pashtuns from three or four provinces who mostly had returned from the West that were getting all of this power at the expense of these very substantial other communities and elite factions. And what I noticed over the years was this larger vanguard of the Republic, whether they were bureaucrats or soldiers or journalists or professors, just feeling increasingly excluded from and not in, no longer invested in the Afghan state. And so it really wasn't a surprise, I think, for many of us when the Taliban came to the gates of Kabul that Ashraf Ghani fled. Um, it wasn't really a surprise to me either that Karzai stayed and is now negotiating to see what he can get for his clique in the next chapter of the state formation. And so to me, what's interesting looking at these two different leaders is, is one, there are some similarities and differences we can talk about, but more that their own impulses as individuals and as leaders at the helm of these precarious regimes meant that they were leveraging the entire apparatus of the state in the service their, of their own survival. And each of them was using whichever currencies they thought would beget them the greatest success. But neither of them uh, could escape the profound vulnerabilities um, of their, that came with being so much at the mercy of their international patrons. And so that brings us to the present moment. So 
I think the American pivot to so-called peacemaking um, was made with the same sort of strategic schizophrenia that had marked the, the war fighting. You know, on the one hand, the US claims to and financially and otherwise continues to support the besieged government, even as it is negotiating with the sworn enemy of that government on that enemy's terms. And that is because the Americans had decided that the time for the war was over. And the Afghan government, if it wanted to continue to receive support for its security forces, it had no choice but to join this process, um, even though it had no, again, no control over the parameters of its engagement. And Ambassador Khalil Zan, who some of you will know, was the envoy of both President Trump and President Biden, and was also instrumental under President Bush after 9-11 had a phrase that he claimed was the guiding motto of the peace process, which was nothing will be decided until everything is decided. And of course, what really became clear is that the real motto is the US decides everything whenever it wants and you know, hell with the rest of it. Um, and so as the US military was like flinging itself towards the exit, as Chris said, the Afghan security sector was left holding the bag and it couldn't, not because its soldiers weren't interested in fighting, but because the entire fighting machine had been, from design to operation to maintenance was predicated on being reliant on American air power and American contractors. And when those disappeared overnight, then you get a, tr a cascading effect. The Taliban's rapid victory was not a function of some extraordinary fighting capacity and certainly not of some groundswell of popular support. It was because the Americans defected, which then triggered a series of elite defections on the and a, based on a calculation that was accurate that the Ghani government could not survive the US departure. And that tragic self-fulfilling prophecy is a reflection of, of where I began. And so I will end there, which is that the survival and therefore the collapse of the post-2001 Afghan government, both were always contingent on the decisions of outsiders, even as those outsiders claimed to be building the Afghan state. And that's how, in the flash of an eye, we now have a moment where the world's most powerful state transformed the Taliban from its mortal enemy into its security partner while, while it's managing an evacuation. And now, of course, um, into what I expect will be a security partner in confronting the next scary terrorist on the horizon, which is the Islamic State. Um, and that is also how those in Afghanistan who saw themselves as friends and partners of the United States learned that all along, in fact, they had been and would be dispensable um, once the Americans decided it was time to leave. And I'll just end with a quote that I read um, from an interview last week that a US government official gave to the National News, which I think is a Gulf newspaper. He said, as long as the Taliban in, are in power, they are a sworn enemy of IS, ISIS-K. It's not as if a deal has been done. It's just an acknowledgement that they are in power and that that is the partner that you need. So I think in a lot of ways, we're just starting this cycle all over again. Now, you know, what can we do? The Taliban won. Again, there's a sort of a framing always that these events sort of unfold beyond our control and we have to just react to them when I think this is really a moment to pause and ask, how did we design an intervention that really foreshadowed only this outcome um, and really no other? And did it really have to be that way? Uh, I, I, I think uh, Chris Turner was <laughs> very briefly. So for those of you who know me, I am very abstemious in my praise. But since the Afghan Taliban has taken over, have taken over, um, we've seen the worst of people um, in our communities, but we've also seen the best of people. 
this woman, <laughs> this woman, I, I, I can't say without fear. So I, whenever an Afghan has needed to get out of that country because of the situation, this woman can come out. And um, I don't know how many she's gotten out, but <laughs> Price in political scientists in political science for someone like her, she effing deserves it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, uh, some of us were slightly aware of uh, what Deepali was doing to help uh, uh, scholars and former um, research partners contributors in Afghanistan, uh, but but uh, Christine knows much more than, than uh, at least I did. So thank you for bringing that to me. And thank you, uh, Deepali, for doing all of that, putting so much work in you. Ambassador Hussein Akani is a senior fellow and director for South and Central Asia at the Hudson Institute. He served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States from, note this period, 2008 to 2011. Dealt quite a lot with President Obama and perhaps a few months of Bush. And is widely credited with managing a difficult partnership during a critical phase. Uh, I think he was ambassador when Bombay was attacked. Um, I saw him on either uh, news hour, PBS news hour, or CNN a couple of times. So he must have seen a great bit more. And his distinguished career in government includes serving as uh, an advisor to four Pakistan prime ministers Yusuf Raza Hilani, Benazir Bhutto, Nawaz Sharif, and Ghulam Mustafa Jatoi. And he also served as Pakistan's ambassador to Sri Lanka from 1992 to 1993, has uh, authored several books um, and has been uh, a speaker at my seminars, both at Michigan and here a few times. And in fact, his last, his most recent book, Reimagining Pakistan, Transforming a Dysfunctional Nuclear State, I think was uh, first presented here. Uh, Brown, um, welcome back, uh, Hussein. It's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, we had a plan at some point to write uh, something together on a in remarkable insight that he had in his uh, book on the Beyond uh, Mosque military. Please correct my if I'm misremembering. Between between. Mosque. So there is a point. Uh, there is a there is a brief paragraph there, which says the following. Uh, in Jinnah papers mention that the model for India-Pakistan relationship should be the U.S.-Canada relationship. And I was so intrigued to, to read this in his book. And then we decided that we might work on this idea together. I am an Indian, he's a Pakistani, and we both worked on it. Perhaps some, some good can come out. We don't know, but uh, at least an intellectual case can be made. And as we're making, making this plan, he gets a call from Islamabad. Uh, you are the next ambassador to, to Washington. And so that was the end of it. <laughs> Hussein, shouldn't well, have, welcome, shouldn't, welcome shouldn't have had that lunch with you, you know, <laughs> in which we planned that book. Um, thank you very much. Look, I can't match uh, Dr. Chris Clary or Dr. Dipali Mukhopadhyay's uh, scholarship, nor can I match uh, Dr. Christine Clare's passion uh, and scholarship. Uh, so I'm just going to make a few general comments based on my own experience of the issue and uh, where I think the US went wrong is still going wrong and why things ended up the way they did and what might we expect in the future based on the four questions uh, that Dr. Vashni mentioned early on. First of all, Chris Perry, um, five books at the age of 65 is not prolific. It's just moderately productive. Um, <clears throat> the reason the United States ended up where it did 
apart from the factors that have been pointed out by both Dr. Christine Fair and uh, Pali, I think it's because the U.S. never had a 20, it stayed in Afghanistan for 20 years, but it never had a 20-year plan for Afghanistan. It actually had 21-year plans. It was always a response to one situation or another. Then there were all the various interests that took over. Uh, the military industrial complex has its interests. The contractor community had its interests. The NGO uh, sort of uh, world had its own interests, and eventually the the what I call the peace complex. You know, there's the military industrial complex, then there is the NGO complex or do gooder complex, and then there is the peace complex that exists in Washington, all with streams of funding, and they all ended up. So it's a it's a joint production of all of these complexes that America stayed there for 20 years, spent as much money as it did, and lost as many lives as it did. Um, there was no plan for 20 years. In fact, on the date that the Twin Towers fell, 9-11, September uh, 11, uh, 2001, the United States did not deem Afghanistan important enough to even have a desk officer for Afghanistan at the State Department or at the CIA or at the Department of Defense. Uh, the CIA had dispensed with its desk officer. The DOD didn't have one. And the State Department uh, desk officer, uh, a very nice man called Al Eastham, who had served in Peshawar before during the war against the Soviets, and therefore knew these people. He had been fired just a week earlier because of a dispute with the then Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia, and was brought back into his position two days after 9-11 because Somebody needed to know what the heck is happening in Afghanistan for us to be able to make a policy. So you can understand that when you go somewhere without any uh, sort of continuity, without any knowledge of the past, and with the American attitude of, you know, this is the only country in the world, by the way, I say this at every event I have, at every university in the United States, just to remind young people of an attitudinal problem. This is the only country in the world where when you say, Jack, is history, what you mean is Jack is irrelevant. In, and, and the conclusion is history is irrelevant. And I remember uh, President Bush telling me uh, about his conversation, because I did overlap with President Bush for several months, um, and he was very kind to me. I presented my credentials to him, and, and, and he always made time, because he by then had realized that he had made a mistake in relation to Pakistan and, and, and in investing as much as he had in Musharraf. So there were two things he told me. One was that, you know, I trusted Musharraf when he said he's making a U-turn, and I think that was a mistake. But the second thing he may, I said was that we got the Pakistanis to cooperate because we threatened them, not because of our offer of incentives, which basically meant that a lesson had been learned, but it was in the year 2008, towards the end of his, uh, of his tenure of office. And, uh, and he had also told uh, Musharraf uh, in, in his earlier conversations that history begins now, meaning don't tell me what happened between your country and mine before, let's start all uh, uh, afresh, which I told him very politely, as politely as I could muster at that time, my English being my second and not my first language, so I had to really make an effort of making it. It was a mistake, Mr. President, to think that history ever begins now because what has happened in the past is always what will shape the future in one way or another. So that was the big mistake there, going into Afghanistan. And this is the year 2008. The US has already been there for about seven years. So 21-year plans, not having a long-term plan, making things along, then getting distracted by Iraq, not getting out of Afghanistan, but not paying enough attention. And so in the end, it was a sort of effort in which for several years, uh, either it was academics in, in, in various universities or young interns elevated to senior positions because nobody else wanted to go to a war zone that were actually making things along. So they were actually implementing what they had read in books and, and heard in universities, not from personal experience and knowledge that comes quite handy in the world of politics, understanding complications and complexities. And, 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 and so the knowledge of Afghanistan was just skin deep when the Americans got involved in Afghanistan. And I personally think that even today it's skin deep because you're applying global models, 
and, and uh, to a society that has its own specificities. It has its own ethnic makeup. It has its own uh, tribal and cultural issues and uh, factors. And then this total reliance on the diaspora and thinking. And I had, you know, uh, for all the books I have written, Chris, some of the, the realistic comments about Afghanistan from my part that come are in only two things. One is George Packer's book about Holbrook, mm -hmm. the, the record of my conversations with Holbrook, in which I'm actually telling him that you're making all these mistakes. And they're just passing references. But for example, you know, when he talked about a grand solution, uh, we'll bring India to the table. And I said, that won't happen till your grandchildren, Richard. So don't do that. And the other was transforming Afghanistan. And I said, no nation gets transformed in a couple of years. And then the last was, we'll build a strong Afghan national army. And I said, Afghanistan has never had a very, very strong national army. And it's not going to have it now either. It may be more practical to have let have regional militias, ethnic militias, who can then, you know, be called in to defend Afghanistan from outside enemies, but nothing more. Uh, but none of the advice was ever taken, partly because I think I knew what I was talking about and advice was taken from people who didn't know what they were talking about, which is the general principle in Washington, D.C., when it comes to other countries. Um, so while there was no knowledge of Afghanistan, there was also no knowledge of Pakistan. Pakistan had been America's ally since 1954. But the, the understanding about Pakistan's complexities, its insecurities, how it came about becoming a country, one very simple thing. Afghanistan always had a weak state, but it always also had a rather strong sense of nationhood. Even today, when I run into a, a cab driver who's a Tajik from Afghanistan, you ask him, what's your identity? Where are you from? He would say, I'm an Afghan. You ask an Uzbek from Afghanistan, he'll still say I'm an Afghan. When you talk to a, a, a Pashtun, he's an Afghan. The Afghan national identity was stronger, state was weak. Pakistan, it's the reverse. Pakistan has a very strong state. It inherited one third of British India's army. And therefore it started out with a large army. And because it had a large army, the army took over. And the army of course is very well trained how to talk to other armies. So especially Anglo-Saxon ones. And so they speak very good English, they make great PowerPoint presentations, and they always convince everybody that they have the great sort of, you know, they have everything under control. But, but the fact of the matter is that 74% of that army comes from one part of Pakistan, which accounts for 52% of Pakistan's population. And the other 48% are not represented significantly in that army and its way of thinking. So Pakistan actually has been engaged in a nation building exercise since 1947, trying to create a new nation where none existed. I mean, it's not like Uzbekistan has become independent because there were Uzbeks always and there was a kind of a Uzbek nation before and then there was a Tajik nation and they got freedom from the Soviets and they've become new countries. No, Pakistan is a new country in the sense that its name is an acronym. Its name is an acronym. There was no Pakistan in history. And then, and ninety percent of American officials that I have interacted with have never understood that. They don't understand. For example, when somebody finally bothered to ask me, "Why do you think so differently from other Pakistani ambassadors that we have interacted with?" I said, "Do you know anything about the ethnic differences in Pakistan?" I come from, from one of the forty-eight percent, the minority groups. There hasn't been one from my group in Washington D.C. for a long time. All you've ever interacted with are people from the Punjab who buy into this Pakistani nationalism narrative, which is taught in Pakistani schools. Hindus and Muslims forever in, incompatible, couldn't live together, two rivers that flowed, uh, but never uh, overlapped, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it totally, did, and the Afghanistan not being even, you know, like Ayub Khan, uh, Pakistan's first military dictator used to say, the Afghans are not even sufficiently Muslim. What is sufficiently Muslim? And why, why is Ayub Khan, who served in the British, who British Indian Army, uh, 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 sitting in judgment on the Afghans in Islam? Similar comments about East Pakistani yeah, yeah, Bengalis yeah. also. Which, which I have, not, which I have, which I have yeah, listed in my book. Sufficiently Muslim. Yeah. So what was what he meant was that the Pakistani Islamo nationalism was not acceptable to these people. And uh, both Christine Fair and Chris Clary explained about Pakistan's 
attitude towards Afghanistan, but basically Afghanistan, Pakistan had a 20 year project before 9-11 and another 20 year project after 9-11. And so therefore that project succeeded and America, which never had a 20 year plan, failed. Uh, and and, and, and uh, I mean, the Americans made a lot of mistakes in Afghanistan and, and Nepali has listed some of them, you know, creating a rentier state. Afghanistan's GDP in the 1990s was only three and a half billion dollars. And yet you hear about billions and billions of dollars being poured into that economy. Is that even rational? Is that even rational? And so now we see that the people who are from Afghanistan and vested in it and political, and look, political operatives don't always follow polit political science textbooks, but sometimes they succeed. I don't think Donald Trump can be explained by any political science textbook that was written before him. There might be one written after him that will explain him. But you know, the political reality is much more complex than, uh, than textbooks. And so um, uh, the Karzai and the Abdullah Abdullahs and the uh, uh, um, uh, Ahmad Masoods, these people, and, and for that matter, the so-called warlords, they all have some tribal and cultural base. Whereas the technocrats who came from overseas, well, you know what? They can always look forward to another university job abroad or uh, another job with the World Bank or, or, or some other international institution. So the four questions that were listed by Ash, quick answers. On what does pa the Taliban victory mean for Pakistan? Um, I, if I'm allowed to engage in blatant self-promotion, I advise everyone to read my piece, Pakistan's Spirit Victory in Foreign Affairs, a month or two ago. And, and it explains everything. Pakistan had a plan, Pakistan sees it as a victory, but Pakistan has problems. Uh, the Pakistani plan assumes that America and the rest of the world will keep funding the Taliban regime and will fund Afghanistan, uh, partly for uh, pre pre preventing a ISIS takeover of Afghanistan or some such thing. Uh, but that funding will not be at the level that the Pakistanis are expecting. So, pa and Pakistan is cash short. So Pakistan will have a problem on that score. Second, because Pakistan is seen as the sponsor of the Taliban, the rest of the world will hold Pakistan responsible for a lot of actions of the Taliban. And so however much Pakistan turns around and says, hey, we are not responsible for their actions because we don't control them. We just have a relationship with them. Not going to be easy. We learned it in primary school that you know if i do something wrong mom will be called to the principal office and so pakistan will have to deal with that problem and lastly the phenomenon that christine fair talked about the average soldier who served in afghanistan having a negative feeling and by the way i sent a cable to islamabad about that when i was ambassador in 2008 i had just gone to a military facility where officer after officer stood up and spoke against pakistan and so i asked all of them where did you pick up these ideas? And their answer was in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. meaning our experience has brought us that. And I sent them a message saying that when Musharraf took over, the first person he called in the United States was General Anthony Zinni, with whom he had served in one of those cent Cento, mm -hmm. Seattle kind of things when Pakistan was part of American sponsored treaty organization. So I said, the relationship that was built when you were Colonel uh, when our, uh, General Musharraf was colonel and Zinni was an American colonel, that came in handy for when they were generals. Well, think about it. These colonels who have this negative view of Pakistan will someday be generals, and they will have a negative view of Pakistan. So Pakistan, so the negative view of Pakistan in the American military, in the CIA, in the uh, even in the State Department, Chris, uh, people who have, for example, the guys who were in the uh, U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan when the Haqqani network, which by the way has nothing to do with the reason why I'm Haqqani, I'm happy to explain that to you <laughs> at some other point. They are actually not Haqqanis, they stole my family name, their actual name is Zadranis, their last name is Zadrani. Anyway, they changed it because Haqqani has a better meaning, it means the truth teller or the righteous. Um, so Pakistan will have problems. Pakistan will also have problems managing the Taliban, and it will also have a problem with the Pakistani Taliban who will be inspired. Yesterday, the FBI came out with a new uh, sort of uh, uh, scare that there are people who are being inspired by the Taliban's victory uh, through the internet 
and there's a lot of recruitment going on right now and self recruitment where somebody decides i am going to become an a, 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 a jihadi a jihadi because if jihad can succeed in afghanistan which is what originally happened al qaeda came out of the jihad against the soviets the idea was we've defeated one superpower we'll defeat the other now do you think when they have defeated the second superpower there will not be a new round of all of that so if if we can be smart for one and the we here is the american the decision making and we should start preparing for that now because as christine fair said we may have to intervene in afghanistan again some day and if we do this time let's not make a stupid mistake of 20 annual plans maybe have one plan for 2 years 5 years whatever but have one plan seriously second the tariq e taliban pakistan will also uh, not be easy for pakistan to manage also pakistan's non militant islamists the political islamists will also take heart and that will also be a problem for the domestic political scenario china uh, does not want the taliban to support the islamist movement in uh, in turkmen uh, in uh, um, sinkyang so the east turkestan islamic movement in particular but there are others but it won't be manageable for the simple reason the one of the things i learned in my life was that these jihadis they have a like a comradeship and a, and they are linked to each other by ideology it's not a uh, it's not a, uh, a, a just a political party that somebody has joined and can actually switch some day they believe in it they are believing i mean like for example the head of the taliban uh, mulla habatullah khunsada he blessed his son for a suicide operation and his son got killed in a suicide operation so a man who has done that given the ultimate he believes in something and these people they believe in something and therefore they have these relationships with each other some are intermarried and so because of that i think that china will be very wary of trusting the taliban completely even though it's trying to manage it. so at some point china may actually become a source of pressure on pakistan similar to the pressure that the americans used to put on pakistan now i don't know if the chinese will be able to deal with pakistan better than the americans we don't know and then there is the farid zakari approach let china and pakistan sort it out at least we are out of there but i think it will have implications for the united states and lastly what are the implications for kashmir and india well i think that the jihad targeting kashmir and india never ended musharraf was very honest about it in his first speech after 911 in which he said i am making a compromise on afghanistan so that i can continue to fight in kashmir that's what he said in urdu ironically when cnn were translating it they deliberately didn't translate that one line because they didn't want at that time the whole motion, attitude was we are winning an ally and we will fight in afghanistan and we will fight al qaeda well kashmir and Uh, india related jihad continues hasn't stopped afghanistan will definitely make it relatively easier because deniability for pakistan will increase because these guys will be able to set up shop in afghanistan rather than in pakistan so stay tuned this story is not yet over unfortunately america is out of afghanistan afghanistan is not yet done with the united states Q. Uh, yes, the first. I promised you a lot of learning, right? And I think all of us are given our different levels of engagement with that region and all the different topics. It's uh, we have twenty-four minutes, twenty-five minutes, roughly. Is there something on YouTube which uh, which are then? Um. So yeah, from YouTube, there were two questions. I think they've sort of been addressed to some extent already. Um. One of them is. Why is the Taliban victory a setback for Kashmir, given the extremely tight counterinsurgency network there? Um, second question, the, the loaded one is: Why is anyone still engaging in the fantasy that the Afghan army was anything but a con and a swindle? A con and a swindle. I don't know whether anyone wishes to comment. I will. I will. You will. Okay. So, so let's let's go. With yeah, Christine first. first. And then, and then, yeah. 
so I'm trying to figure, how do I phrase this up without getting too inside baseball on Islam? So the reason why the Pakistani TTP is a problem, first of all, these are totally different organizations, right? The Pakistani Taliban is not the same as the Afghan Taliban. Pakistan loves to exploit that ignorance because then it says, how can we support that Taliban when it's also killing us? Oh, dear Lord. Um, they exploit this ignorance all the time. But the problem- But there is an ideological yes, brotherhood, right? I'm getting there. So the problem is that the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistan Taliban, they all come from this Deo Bundy milieu. And though Deo Bundys are not a majority in Pakistan, or so we think, although there's no data to buttress that, um, they have this huge archipelago of Deobandi madrasas that produce ulama or religious scholars. Um, even though the Deobandi madrasa system began in India, Deobund as it's manifest in Pakistan is really quite different. So how does Pakistan manage the Pakistani Taliban? This is why Kashmir is so important as is this ideological umbrella in which uh, they are encased. So what Pakistan does and what it has done since around 2009 is that it has reinvested in a group that was otherwise dead, the Jaish al Muhammad. Right? It too is a Dale Bundy group. So from the Pakistani point of view, I wanna be really clear about this, as long as the Pakistani Taliban do not target those precious Punjabis that Ambassador Haqqani just mentioned, Everyone else is collateral, right? It's, it's livable collateral in the service of Pakistan's larger project, which we've all spoken about in various degrees. If the Pakistan Taliban miscalculate as they did in 2009, when they attacked Bunair, and then went on to make Islamabad, Islamabad, and target uh, state apparatus in the Punjab, rest assured the state is going to kick into motion just as we saw it do with Zarbe Azab. Jaisha Muhammad is the, if you're familiar with Indian policy, it's the Garvapathy, if you will, for wayward Deobandis, right? The Pakistani Taliban are, will be and have been given two choices, which is you can go back and join your Deobandi brethren in Afghanistan or you can join Jaish Muhammad and go take on the, 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 the smaller shaitan of India. If you stay here, rest assured, we will eliminate you. And that's what they did. Now, these organizations, what makes these organizations different, I say these, these Deobandi organizations different from say, Lashkar Taiba, which has a very firm hierarchical structure reflecting the complete security that it enjoys within the Pakistani state. Deobundi organizations, they are actually networks of networks of networks. So if you take out one of them, the rest of the network remain intact, right? So this means that until Pakistan resolves that it's not going to use terrorism as a tool of foreign policy, it will constantly be mowing the grass, right? It'll be whacking the weeds, but it's never going to get to the root of the weeds because it's not in its interest to do so. So this is why India is probably going to be the most direct um, loser of this because these groups, many people think they only care about Kashmir. That's also a huge misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, it, the whole thing is, is really about taking out India through the exploitation of its communal factor, right? So this is the Guzwal Hind, which is the same thing talked about in the great background on Guzwal Hind. Um, I'm going to just very briefly, I think. That's the next book. Yeah, the next book. I have, I have another euphemism for it. I won't say it here because you might want me. It, it, it re revolves around my Punjabi interest. But um, going back to what the comment was about the ANA, I take extreme umbrage. If that were remotely true, the oh, Afghan no, National no. Army, this may interest you or not. But our soldiers, active duty, as well as veterans, have been so incensed by what President Biden has done that they are getting their interpreters and their partners out. They are setting up 
GoFundMe campaigns. They are contacting people like the Poly and me and uh, Task Force Pineapple. And a, a, what is Task Force Pineapple? These are retired American servicemen in Afghanistan building a clandestine network to get people out. They would not be doing this if the ANA were as that individual suggested. What we asked of the ANA after we withdrew all of these services was essentially asking them to go on suicide missions. They also have what our soldiers never encountered. The Taliban threatened their family. So as a sister of soldiers, I would say, and I have, I, my brother and I, we've had heated debates as he attempted to mansplain to me a theater that, that he has had no experience in. As a sister, I would not want my brothers to fight in those conditions. I would want them to live to fight another day. So whoever said this about the ANA, shame on you. You have absolutely no knowledge of that country and you have no knowledge of how they showed up every single day to make sure that our men and women got home safe. Let me just add, uh, the Afghan national forces suffered far greater casualties and fatalities than the US did. The US number of casualties is just around 3,000 under that. The Afghan National Security Forces lost 70,000 uh, men in battle. For the last two years, almost 95% of all combat was undertaken by the Afghan National Security Forces. The problem was, and this problem, by the way, I have discussed. I have discussed it with five commanders who served in Afghanistan, General Petraeus, General uh, Campbell, General Nicholson, uh, uh, General um, Agard. Uh, so anyway, uh, five, last Dunford. five. Dunford. Dunford. Um, all five of them said that the way we trained the Afghan security forces was to try and make them as close as to, you know, as soldiers to American soldiers. There are two problems with that. Uh, Afghanistan is a low-tech society. And so these people are coming with a lot less uh, sort of uh, uh, adaptability to technology than, say, for example, someone who since childhood has played with relatively higher tech toys, uh, has made tea or coffee through a machine, has taken things out of a, uh, a vending machine, whatever. I mean, anything that involves some technology. And so all of a sudden, you've made them into a high tech fighting uh, sort of team. And then most of that technology you kept under in, in your own hands because you didn't want it to fall into enemy hands. So one of the things was that almost all maintenance was done by contractors. And there were 18,000 contractors and President Biden withdrew them. So the withdrawal of all those contractors meant that the Afghan Air Force just simply couldn't fly anymore because planes need maintenance to fly. Uh, a lot of the uh, sort of computerized stuff that the so forces had in terms of, you know, a an old Afghan soldier would have been able to figure out, you know, sort of looking at the, uh, figuring out how to go. Now you have all this technology and this gadgetry, and all of a sudden you withdraw these contractors. And people like me, by the way, begged personally as well as in writing that the one thing that should be done is keep the way open for contractors. And President Ghani, for all his faults and weaknesses, requested President Biden in his June meeting that if nothing else, let us hire third country contractors, people who have served in the South African military, in the British military, et cetera, who can help us maintain and keep everything going. And yet, with all due respect to him, President Biden had the audacity to come on television and say, the Taliban don't have an air force. We have the Afghan army, Afghan military has an air force. Um, it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. And we should always respect, and this is something generally, um, that this dismissiveness towards allies is not going to help the United States in years to come when there are so many people who are looking forward or are talking about a global competition with another country that does a reasonably good job of keeping allies on board. I meant China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, let's take questions from the audience uh, that is present here. We have 10 minutes at least. We can go slightly over if necessary. Whatever your questions are, there are two, mi two microphones here. 
So if you can walk up to them and also introduce yourself to the to the panel and ask your question, that would be wonderful. We have Professor you. Yes, please go ahead. I'm a little bit short. <laughs> um, thank you guys all for being here today. First of all, I'm Maya. I'm a freshman. Um, Professor Fair, I remember that you said earlier that the U.S. could have maintained a counterterrorism presence in Afghanistan, and that really caught my attention. I was wondering what would have had to change for this to be a reality today, and when, and also what would this presence look like? So picking up on what Hassan Akani just said, it would have looked a lot like what we had in place before Biden precipitously withdrew it. So there's, there was discussion of drones. There's an over-fetishization of drones in this country. Drones is merely a platform from which we drop ordnance. What makes drones a very accurate way of dropping ordnance is that we have to have a system of intelligence. Right. We know that when we rely on what's called uh, a signature strike, signature strike is basically we're, we're using non-human intelligence sources and we're coming up with, I mean, I've been, I've been in these targeting discussions. Um, I, there was one targeting discussion that got to the point of the individual, the treatment was already being determined and the treatment was elimination. This is a very, this, the next step was to go out and eliminate this person. What saved that individual was that two distinct teams that were feeding intelligence into what's called the targeting package had different photographs, right? So if only one had showed up to the meeting with a photograph, that person would have been eliminated, right? So what is, what, one of the problems that we had in Afghanistan systematically was that um, our CIA, never went out and met with people. They expected all of their assets to come to the fortress. Um, I did not go to the fortress because it was just so flamingly irritating. So that's not how you study, that's not how you cultivate intelligence assets. In contrast, what made the drone program in Pakistan very selective and very effective was that we had people on the ground who, who did shipping, right? With the, and the Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban were so afraid of this that they, they didn't know um, they were afraid of drinking tea from strangers. They were afraid of eating. Quickly explain chipping, just in one yeah, sentence. Yeah, so Not essentially, the way way ordinance lands on something precisely is that you have a piece, a little gizmo that directs the, the ordinance to the target. So if, by the way, if you've got the wrong dude, <laughs> the gizmo will very precisely kill the wrong dude, right? So the discussion of having drones um, operate in the theater without having these assets on the ground is, is simply going to be that we're going to kill the wrong people, right? And we've already seen that. And there'll be enormous strategic impacts of that. The, the Pakistan drone program is a very different program. It's not the same. There are multiple drone programs in Afghanistan. There's one drone program in Pakistan. So to answer, what would a CT package look like? Well, we need to have the embassy, right? Embassies are how you justify having supplies then we would have had to have negotiated Bagram, right? And Ghani certainly was interested, as Hussein noted, with the contractor issue. If you understood the contracting economics, um, these weren't just Americans showing up. There's a, there's, so there's a, there is a serious moral question that we as Americans have to ask ourselves, which is the outsourcing of war. Um, an American working for Blackwater is not being paid the same as a Nigerian working for Blackwater, right? And the IEDs don't make a distinction. So we had to have the contractors, we had to have the drones, we had to maintain this train function, right? So this was all sustainable, right? It's, so when people say, well, we wouldn't have stayed there forever, I'm like, um, are you a clown? Of course we could. How long have we been in South Korea, right? This was completely sustainable. Um, how we're not bombing South Korean villages every day. Hold on, but you're not understanding my point. The counter, the whole point of the sustainability of the presence was that ANA was doing that. We weren't, right? So if we were going to continue this, we actually had to cultivate better intelligence. 
right? And we haven't done that. But I don't so, think, I think we can't. This dog don't do that. This we, dog, we, this well, dog this dog better a... learn a few things. Otherwise, no, no, otherwise, no. otherwise, yes. otherwise, this, let's, let's yes. pay I, tribute I wanna, to the I Chinese wanna, forever. I, I just want to finish this point, Chris. So the drone program in Pakistan did exactly that. It did exactly that. Um, it has been the subject to all sorts of disinformation given out by the ISI as well as the Taliban on the ground. It did exactly that because it was covert. Right? Does it mean that we didn't make mistakes? But in, journalists who did their job correctly, which was they sent a local uh, stringer to Fatah, I mean, and they interviewed people who prepare corpses, right? Because in Islam, just like Judaism, you have to bury something, um, and there's a there's a there's a time frame to do it, and it costs money. So you you don't have people you know dig graves and, and prepare a coffin in a janaza <laughs> when no one's in the coffin or in the grave, right? So when the journalists did their job, what they found was that overwhelmingly the drone program in Pakistan targeted who they thought they targeted. And even the people who prepared the body said they were terrorists. Now they have a different definition of terrorists than probably you or I do, right? So that, that dog can do that. But we had different dogs in Afghanistan. That's my point. Okay. In the interest of Yes. Chris, uh, short comment on the, and then at some point, we have to imagine after 20 years of failure with different generals, with different presidents, that we're not going to get it right. Right. At some point, you have to give up on that task. And it is imaginable. I can imagine a system which has a higher rate of success. I think if we think about all of the elements that went into the success of the Pakistani drone strike program, which by the way was, you know, had this issue of not being perceived as a success. I think you've written about this very well, but what you're asking, right, is we have to sustain Bagram indefinitely. We have to sustain the embassy in Kabul indefinitely. We drove two Afghan leaders insane, Ashraf Ghani and Hamid Karzai. Maybe they weren't that stable to begin with, but for, I think, Nepali's word of precarity, this fact that they were clients in this perilous place for years, they kind of went crazy. And it's, I just don't think we can sell that if we had just done this lighter footprint, it would have been the same. As the Afghans, as the Afghans who are trying to get out of that country right now, ask the women and girls, these teachers who said existed, and now we've taken away from them. No, but very a quick comment, what very quick comment. Yeah, yeah, very quick the comment. comment. Look, either the United States is going to remain a superpower and therefore will have to get engaged in other theaters of the world, or it can be go back to its isolation. And then all those people who are actually isolationists at heart uh, or whose arguments are isolationist, but pretend to be realist, will have to get out of business. The point is this, uh, this argument that, well, we just can't do it because we, look, you didn't know how to use nuclear weapons, but you did, you figured out. So my point is you have to learn. Why is it that when it's about other people's lives, whether it's about other people's futures, whether it's when it's about, you just, oh boy, we made a mistake in Vietnam, so sorry. Okay, move on, write a few books, maybe a couple of bad movies and we move on. Okay. You have to learn, period. And if you don't want, and, and now you have a big enough base through immigration of people who are not from Idaho and Iowa and actually do bring some knowledge from other cultures. So improve America's cultural learning to be a more effective superpower in the 21st century and learn more, some yeah, lessons yeah, from okay, this, yeah, Just if you can. Yeah, yeah. Part of the reason I feel so strongly about this, yeah. we have young people in the audience, in a few years, in five or 10 years, you're gonna be sold the need for an intervention. Could be Libya, maybe the Congo. And they're gonna tell you no true counterinsurgency has ever been tried. No true counterterrorism has ever been tried, but it won't work. And we are gonna abandon these next people just like we abandoned the Afghan because we are a feckless power. So the key thing is not to get in there in the first place because we don't have it within us institutionally. We forget. Nobody knows anything. Look at DC. 
the number of real Afghan experts. It's a disgrace. We were in that country for 20 years and nobody knows anything about that place. We've been working with Pakistan for decades. And the number of Pakistan experts in America is, is I think, mind-bogglingly small. So we have to accept the limitations on our own power because if not, we will be hopeful that the next time we won't fuck it up. But you know what we will? And those interpreters and soldiers are gonna be calling and WhatsApping us and saying, I need to get out of the country. My family is still there. If they do get out, they're gonna say my wife is still there. I, she's calling me, there's raids in the neighborhood. And that is our moral culpability. Okay. So, so don't so break things like that. Here is my summary of what, what happened. Some, something very important happened here. One position is that the United States has uh, an incurable in, uh, incapacity to learn about the world and put that learning to use in its statecraft. Chris Clare's position. Right. It, there's nothing. Just look at how many Pakistan specialists are here after being in Pakistan since 1954, etc. Et the position that Hussein and I think uh, Christine are taking says that that may be empirically true, what Chris is saying, but there is a normative, normative. Uh, a requirement of, a, of, of, of being a superpower, namely, you must create this capacity inside. You must create more Pakistan experts and Afghanistan experts and Congo experts, and you have the resources to do it. That is your, oh, if you will, moral obligation. And if you say it that way and, and plan accordingly, you can do it. I think this, these are that's what these two positions are. Yeah, this, this was a very important conversation that took place. We have we, we're running out of time, but we can I think accommodate two more questions. So I, I saw two hands. Uh, so go ahead, um, Binish, go ahead and, and introduce yourself, and then Umar, and then then we'll 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 take uh, uh, the the remarks on on your remarks. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Binish Pervez, and I am a PhD student in the political science department at Brown. And my question is uh, coming from. Um, is directed towards uh, Pair about uh, strategic culture and the centrality of strategic culture uh, in um, informing the behavior of the Pakistani military and just the state overall. I am more interested as an academic scholar trying to think about ways in which strategic cultures change over time because they're not inherent, their fluid, culture is fluid as a concept, right? So what do you think are, like, what do you think are those ways in which the strategic culture can actually change over the long term and how does the strategic culture of the US and other countries that are also involved in this equation, how does that matter? I had another question, but I can just yeah. uh, find out. Know, you can also ask both questions. Thank you, Ashwin, and thank you to all the panelists for a moment. But how are, yeah. uh, so how are Pakistan's civil military relations impacted generally by foreign crises? And then more specifically, if you feel they are impacted, then would there be any difference in the impact on Pakistani civil military relations caused by the recent Afghanistan withdrawal and the Afghanistan situation compared to Pakistan's typical crises with India? And I guess this question is more uh, for Chris and Ambassador Haqqani. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm differing it. I'm, I'm passing it on. To no, I'm I'm going to pass it on to Chris. Not for any other reason, but for the simple reason that my short uh, version of Pakistan's civil military relations as they exist is that everything impacts them only on a, in a passing way. There's a very deep, stable sort of uh, equation there, Unsta deep, st unstable, stable equation, but that equation is very much there. In the end, the chief of the army staff wins. Uh, so so it's, it's casino rule, the house wins. Uh, that's the way it is. Now, I agree with Binish's suggestion that culture has changed, strategic culture has changed. So when that happens, inshallah, uh, that's going to be another time. But, you know, in one lifetime, this is where I am. Uh, that um, after after three imprisonments and 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 uh, two uh, firings, 
and 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 a few million uh, abusive tweets. Uh, I think that right now the civil military relationship is not going to be affected, and it's becoming less and less relevant also because the um, military side has now insinuated itself into the civilian side so deep, both on the political and non-political levels and academic level, journalism, et cetera, et cetera, that it actually has the ability to call shots without changing. Can I just get this If Punjabi domination of Pakistan's military uh, declines or, or is reduced by intention or by planning, then the strategic culture might change. Yeah, but it'll take, my, this, it'll take this is what you argued. Yeah. I think, uh, if I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is this was a very important part of or the last chapter or a penultimate chapter. Yeah, so I'll address that with your, so. Because I don't disagree with Hussein. I mean, there, there were particular ornaments to that argument that was relevant that I'll come to. So strategic, so, so, the, so for me, Pakistan empirically, is a productive place to inquire about strategic culture for one reason is that you, you can we were think about a strategic culture of a nation like let's say the united states for example you have to very seriously look at the strategic culture of all of these different bureaucracies and how they interact that is a multi-body problem there's really right um the pakistan case is really quite elegant um, because to a first order approximation, the army is the only institution that matters for the things that I would suggest matter to people who care about Pakistan's internal, but most importantly, external. So if it weren't for the ability to make that first order reduction, that it's primarily the only institution that matters, this would be a superfluous exercise. So I could repeat what I did empirically for the Indian Army. It would have very little predictive utility because the Indian Army does not have a seat at the big person's table, right? And even despite the various, you know, prorations of the 50-inch casino walla, um, this has not changed substantially. So then the question is empirically, if you're setting up a research design, you have to ask, well, how do I, you have to understand how this is how strategic cultures are, as you said, not only generated, but most importantly, sustained. How do they evolve over time? So um, uh, there are a number of books that sort of talk about this. Militaries are fascinating because they are very conservative. I don't mean conservative politically, I mean they're very resistant to change. I can, my ability to predict, I don't care what country it is, my ability to predict that someone is infantry is very high. <laughs> Yeah, once you know them, you know them. Um, and they do very similar things. Um, so that's what makes the Pakistan case so interesting. So then as a researcher, you have to set up some counterfactual. It's too easy to say it doesn't change and therefore it doesn't change, right? You have to then ask, well, if I were looking for signs of change, let me propose some things that I would observe. So one of the things, if Pakistan, if Pakistan's military was truly interested in peace with India, as I can't, um, you can't see my smirk, I'm wearing a mask. I should expect it to be more amenable to economic liberalization with India, right? And by the way, that would also be good for Pakistan's economy, which would also give the economic base from which the army predates uh, more cushion, right? I see, not only do I see no evidence of that, I actually see every time um, there is a civilian who attempts to make such a rapprochement. I see the army actively undermining it. Right. I've come to the point where, yeah. right, th there's no use in India talking to a Pakistani. Why? I said, I, I don't have a watch right now, but I used to say, I'm now, as soon as there's some, you know, prime minister, you know, kumbaya, wearing matching vests, rolling hands, see some important city um, throughout the world, I said, my watch. A terrorist attack is going to happen with them. I, it, it, I, I have not been wrong about this. Why? Because it is really bad for the Pakistan army business, right? At the end of the day, and this is a problem of equifinality, whether we look at material interest or strategic culture, it produces the same result. So if you're going to pursue this issue of strategic culture, you have to ask to what end, like what predictive ability does it have? And I would argue um, 
some of the pioneering work in strategic culture was done on the Chinese tape, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so why is that? Because the Politburo is is the thing that drives all other everything else is like a satellite question. Um, North Korea might be a place. But the problem with North Korea is access to data. So what makes Pakistan so great as a problem is that we every library that was ever a part of the PL480 program has a reservoir of primary source materials. It's actually easier to do that work here than it is in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Pakistan is terrible archival resource. Um, polite. So, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. Oh yeah, one to, point, last to, your, to your point. So what are some of the things that could exogenously change this? Well, that's very hard. And I walked through that. It's like, A, the US has shown that it's unable, unwilling, first noted to do those things. But there could be some source of endogenous change. So um, by the time when I was still writing that book, um, Pakistan was still engaged in active counter-terror slash counter-miscreant operations. Up until 2004, the first Pakistani casualty would usually happen um, in some engagement with the Indian, even if it were at the accident, right? They would still be a Shaheed killed by an Indian. After 2004, this really begins to dramatically shift. Many of the unit's first casualties would have come from fighting in Pakistan, killed by a Pakistan. So the Pak again, speaking to how armies were, this is why you will notice just as Pakistanis were being ground up by their own citizens, the ISI floats this very helpful myth that these are actually Indian agents, right? So I, I put it at a very low probability that Pakistan's own experience fighting Pakistanis could, and so the same math that Hussein noted, right? These, these colonels are gonna become generals, these majors are gonna become colonels and so forth. But the Pakistan army is very good, just like all armies at sort of correcting course, right? And even if it doesn't know what you feel, if you can do that, it can see your behavior. And because it's a womb to tomb organization, very significant perk with it, um, you don't defect. And that's why in these track two things, you'll see these, you know, Kumbaya, peacenik generals. It never said this in uniform. And even in retirement, they'll go all peacenik on you, again, because of the incentives of the Kumbaya circuit, right? Plowshares. You know, if they were to have like their meetings in, say, Kalman, there would be no kumbaya general. But yeah, let's just talk about peace in Chiang Mai. Oh yeah, I'm totally down for peace, right? Christine, we'll have to leave it yes. here. Leave it. <laughs> um, uh, I think, I think uh, we all agree that we've had uh, two, two, two remarkably enlightening hours on uh, a matter of remarkable significance for, for the world at this point. And uh, it's time to thank our, our speakers.